I've made it my life's mission beyond you know my own personal my own personal soapbox is to kind of remove the stigma of mental health and talk about it. And whether I talk about it within the context of being funny and entertaining, or whether I just talk about it like I'm talking to you today, or I've always talked to my children, it's, um, I actually, because I have ADHD, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> did you really? I really did. What was I saying? For me, it was such a joy. The fact that this is something that I got to share with her, you have no idea how special this is for me. The hardest part of the, I mean, everybody's gone through a lot this year, but the hardest part for me was to be away from my kids. She, I didn't see her for, like in person. I didn't sit with her like this for over a year. I mean, we're both, and we'll talk about that, but we're both incredibly neurotic. And she didn't come out of her, you didn't come out of your house for a year, right? No. It was really, really hard. It was also really hard because I think a lot of people, a lot of people know that he has OCD and he's suffering with this. Uh, I don't think as many people know that I suffer with the same issues and I have anxiety that sometimes leads to depression and a lot of it has to do with germs also. And so it was hard for me and I also work with a therapist every week to try to get myself out there and go back into the world. I mean, this is the first time I've been around anyone other than my family. While Howie Mandel and his oldest daughter, Jackie Schultz, were keeping their social distance throughout the pandemic, they remained in constant communication. And their regular phone calls ultimately led to the launch of their new comedy podcast, Howie Mandel Does Stuff, which they've been hosting together since April. Hi everybody, this is uh, beloved Howie Mandel. And his daughter, Jacqueline Schultz. We're going to be doing a lot of fun stuff. We're going to do prank calls. I'm going to have my celebrity friends on. I'm going to go look for jobs. I'm going to uh, do things that have never been done on the airwaves before. The reason that we even came up with the podcast was because we, we would spend hours every day. I just need to be connected to my kids more than anything. So we would spend hours on the phone every day and just trying to make each other laugh by doing prank calls or talking or giggling. And my wife once walked in and said, what, what, so what is this for? We're like, what are you doing? What's all this noise? You're doing prank calls and what is this for? And I, for, for us. And then she said, you should record it. And now that's our podcast. But that just came out of a necessity of trying to connect with my child. The comedian, actor, TV host, and now podcaster has also been an outspoken mental health advocate ever since his 2006 appearance on The Howard Stern Show, where Howie first revealed his ongoing struggle with obsessive compulsive disorder. Here's the thing about OCD. You know, people come up to me and they go, I have a little bit of OCD. And you can't have a little bit of OCD. OCD are these intrusive thoughts that keep coming in so much that you have no control and you can't stop. And those thoughts are so strong that it stops your life. So, and, and, and to give you, an, like if somebody shook my hand, I could shake hands, I don't shake hands. I could shake hands, but I'm afraid that if I get triggered, if your hand is a little bit uh, wet or moist or somebody, and then I go and wash my hands, it, that sticks into my head and then I go, well, I probably didn't wash it good enough. I go back in and I scald it and then I walk out and I go, I didn't get every inch of it and I go back in. I could be on that loop for hours and miss an important appointment. It sounds silly and it sounds crazy and it sounds silly and crazy to me and that makes it even worse because I'm intelligent enough to understand that this, what, what is going on in my hand is not dangerous, what is happening, but I can't stop myself. That's the obsession and the compulsiveness to do things. The more debilitating the thought, the more repetitive it becomes. I think that's also the misconception about OCD. Like yours isn't necessarily just germs. Yeah. Whatever enters his head that he can't get out, and, and I'm the same way. It's not always about the pandemic and germs. It's whatever enters your head, you can't get out, and it prohibits you from functioning and living. Totally shut you down, like a skipping record. I think the scariest thing too is knowing that it doesn't make sense. Like, you yes. legitimately know that what you're thinking and what you're doing is not making sense and you shouldn't be doing it and you can't stop yourself. So that's, that's kind of the scariest thing is being cognizant and aware and not being in control when all you want to do is control. Right, yeah. and you know, you like even, yeah, I'll go to yesterday. You know, it, it, I try to anchor myself by saying, you know, I have 
a beautiful family who at the moment are healthy. Um, I have a, a, a career that at the moment is going. I'm doing everything that I love to do. Yet, if anybody reading this could look at my life, and I know they would go, oh my God, I would trade places in a heartbeat. I would trade places with me in a heartbeat just if you put on the list that all the accomplishments and what I have in my life, and yet I am in a devastatingly dark depression yesterday, going like it doesn't even make sense. But it just, it's painful to feel this way, you know? And it, it, it hurts all the time. And there isn't, I don't think I've gone 24 hours of my life now that I think back without a struggle. You know, I, mostly good now and I've got like little coping mechanisms and things that I do and uh, I'm surrounded by great loving people and a great family but it's it's not easy. Mine is not as steady. Mine comes in like flows depending on what's going on in my life and the world around me. There's been times where I've been to therapy and I can't function and I go multiple times a week and there's times when I'm okay just checking in with my therapist but I think re like really when this pandemic hit which happened to a lot of people and I'm not the only one like that's when my world got flipped upside down and also because I'm a mom who just wants what's best for her kids and I couldn't figure out how to cope with what I was going through much like him I didn't want to get out of bed. I couldn't function and I have two little ones that are counting on me. So I had to figure out like, how do I function? How do I still go through life? My kids are counting on me, especially now that they're home 24 seven. I got to figure this out. And that was the hardest for me because it's really, really hard to figure out how to manage and cope with what you need to do and still be there for your family. But I'm a proponent. I don't think there's anybody alive that can function through life without help. And we all go, we, we, we think it's good to go without help. I've said this ad nauseum, but your mental health should be looked at and be part of the curriculum, like your dental health. Even when something doesn't bother you before this year, you would go a couple times a year just to go get x-rays, to get it clean, to make sure that there's something in there. We don't have as part of our curriculum where people could just talk to somebody. And nobody, nobody has all the tools. There isn't anybody alive that doesn't need a coping skill. But what always will work for absolutely everybody is being open. That's why I wanted to do this, is just being open, just open. And whether you talk to your mom, whether you talk to your daughter, whether you talk to your plumber, whether you, and keep talking, I think that's the key. You don't have to have OCD. You don't have to have clinical depression. You don't have to be diagnosed with anxiety. There's nobody alive that at some point is not gonna need help in coping. And whether that coping is, you know, I'm so frustrated at work, I like to go to the gym after. That's a coping skill, you know, or I like to meditate, or I just like to breathe, or I need my alone time, or I just wanna put on my headset and listen to my music. Whatever that is, or I, I need a tub of ice cream to get me through the night, whatever, these are all coping skills. And as the animals we are, we need those because we don't cope well, we don't. Howie grew up in Toronto and was 21 years old when he went to his first comedy club on April 19th, 1977, a night he'll never forget. So they opened up a comedy club in Toronto and I'd never seen stand-up comedy live. And I went to the comedy club and uh, I watched it. The host of the club, it was at Yuck Yucks in Toronto, said, does anybody want to try their wares? If you think you can do this, get up on stage after midnight and do your five minutes. And somebody said, you should do it, Howie. And I went, okay, like I always do. I always just say yes. And if I thought anything funny was gonna come out of it was the fact that somebody was gonna go, ladies and gentlemen, Howie Mandel, and I was gonna show up on stage, and I'm not a comedian. Therein lies the joke, and therein lies the end of what I believed would be my career, like the 15 seconds of, it'd be funny just to say on a dare I did that. And what happened was um, I went backstage and somebody went, Mark Breslin went, ladies and gentlemen, Howie Mandel. And I walked out. And, you know, they, there was a smattering of applause. I was blinded by the light of the spotlight. 
And then um, the applause ended, and I look down and I see faces, and they're just sitting there, these strange faces, waiting for me to do, oh my God, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> and I remember this like it's yesterday because I've been trying to regain that moment ever, uh, you know, ever since. I got um, terrified, terrified, because I just went, this is embarrassing. It's like being in that nightmare where you show up at a party in your underwear or, the, or whatever, just that. So now I'm standing in front of, in a group of strangers at, with a microphone and I have nothing, nothing. There's no reason for me to be here. And it's like inside me, who's the joke on? It's like, and they're just looking at me and waiting and that terror just took over my whole body, my whole being. And if you look at videos from then, you know, from my act then, um, I started going, okay, okay, all right, okay, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> what, what? Oh. <laughs> and it was just a terror of trying to think of something, trying to, okay, all right, no, no, okay. What, what, what? And people started giggling, and I didn't under, even understand. I go, what, 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 tell me. What, what? What are you laughing at? What are you laughing at? Oh, okay, all right, oh, please. And they started laughing more, and I go, please don't laugh, it's gonna throw me. And that got a bigger laugh. And because I was out in public, I always carried rubber gloves because I'd have to maybe use the men's room and I didn't want to touch. So I was always at drugstores buying PPE. So I put my hands in my pocket. I was really scared. I put my hands in my pocket and I felt the rubber glove and I just took it out. Hey, when you get home, try this, all right? And I didn't know what to do. And I took the rubber glove and I, I pulled it over my head and I pulled it past my nose and I was just breathing normally. Okay, how many fingers am I holding up? And I hear the, the audience is roaring. So I start blowing it up with my nose and it pops off my head. Thank you very much. And the whole audience goes like that. And I had enough wherewithal to go, good night. Good night, thank you, you've been great. And I went, good night, I walked off and Mark Breslin was in the, at the, at the side. He goes, that was great, you gotta come back tomorrow. And I went, for, for what? He goes, you gotta do it again. I go, do what? What you did? He goes, didn't do anything. <laughs> But I went back every night, and I gotta tell you, that night changed my life. And that night gave me the coping skill that allows me to be here now, and I'll tell you why. Because of that terror, and I never felt more in the now. You know, I wasn't thinking about anything else. I wasn't thinking about what could happen, how embarrassing this is. I wasn't thinking about something that did happen to me earlier in the day. Like these things are always swirling around in my mind. You know, if I can't just sit blankly, that's why I can't sit with, if you leave me with my own thoughts, it's a dark place. So I've never been more alive and terrified. My time on stage is that moment is that time, that's where I'm most comfortable. And again, you know, from that day on, I went every night. And that's 45 years ago, probably, but close to 45 years ago. In 45 years, up until last March 6th, I don't think I ever spent, the longest I was never on stage was two and a half weeks. And this year has killed me because I don't have that live connection. That's why I needed her Let's do prank calls. Let's just hear somebody <laughs> laughing. Just that, like, and it's a connection. It's not only about making them laugh. It's about just being in the room with somebody and kind of knowing and feeling a lot. I just need something that keeps me busy. And nothing keeps me in the now more than being on stage doing stand-up comedy. So I, you know, they always say if you could just make one person smile, you're doing your job. What people don't know is that one person that I'm working on is me. A lot of people ask me what it was like to how Howie Mandel as a father, and it must have been so much fun because it was comedy all the time, and a lot of the times it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. No, no real comedy at all. No, no. But did you know it was different than other people's houses? I mean, yeah. Remember we asked my friend Natasha once? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. We asked my friend once, um, like, is your family like this? And she's like, no, like, she, like straight up, no. So like, I knew that other families were a little bit different and we were quirky, I guess could be the word that you say, but. We didn't get along because it started like that. And then, you know, we couldn't be closer, but for five years, as a teenager, it kind of ripped us apart. She hated me. 
Yeah, no, we didn't get, we're best friends now. I was a daddy's girl when I was a little girl, but there was a time I think between my whole high school years that we did not get along at all and we fought every single day. Obviously when you're a teenage girl, there's always going, you want to be by yourself and you want to do your own thing. And there was a lot of control issues, I think especially with someone that has OCD and wants to control stuff, it was tenfold. When she became a teenager, it was, in my mind, uh, uh, it was really hard to let go. And uh, a big issue for me personally is control of everything. Everything and anybody in my, and, and I don't allow that to get out of control. And when it does get out of control, I don't cope really well. I, I, I have trouble coping. So there was a lot of control issues about me being safe, knowing where I was, even what did I touch, what did I get into, stuff like that. So we had a lot of trouble getting along during those times. I think that I started to understand that we are much more alike than we are different. And perhaps that's the reason why we butt heads so much. We both have these control issues and we both need to do things a certain way. And both of us, when we get something in our head, like there's no stopping us. It takes over our life and it controls us. And like he said, you can't really move on. So that was a big struggle. And when I started to realize that, then we started to be able to deal with each other. And we also went to therapy and stuff like that to figure it out. And I think also having kids and becoming a mom made me realize even more about how much he actually cared about me and how everything that we went through together was because of his love for me, whether it was the right reaction all the time or the wrong reaction, it didn't matter. I feel actually like I'm very fortunate because I had my dad who is very open about his issues, very open about going to therapy, very open about talking about it and erasing the stigma. So right away, whenever I was upset or sad or depressed or anxious or having a bad day, I knew that I can talk about it and reach out and there wasn't gonna be a stigma and there's someone that I can go see. So that's the benefit of having that. I didn't really ever feel alone because I had my dad to tell me, you know, people go through this and it's something that you just have to take care of. So it was helpful growing up with him. While both Howie and Jackie continue to work on their mental health, they both agree nothing can brighten their day quite like family. I'm 65 years old and I feel like I'm broken, you know? But watching my grandchildren is the most joy, the most light, the most uh, comforting. The, the only thing that matters to me in my life is my, well, and, and my kids. But, but, the, grand, <laughs> but the grandkids, I, I, I've never experienced anything like this in my life, you know? And when uh, they were allowed to come back into my, into my life and I could just hold them, you know, which is counterintuitive to how I've always felt my life in my life, but the fact that I can hold them, I don't care about anything else in the world. So the, the light in my life are my children and grandchildren. That's the sunshine that's worth, you know, th this pain, going through this pain and keep enduring this pain for that sunshine. But I do feel like I'm very broken. I am very fortunate to have my kids, which are not only a distraction, but they reinforce that I'm doing okay because they're so amazing. So every time I look at them and they're, you know, they're just being them. I, I mean, I'm a proud mom, so I think they're the best kids in the world. But every time I look at them, I'm like, okay, like, not doing that bad. I must be doing something okay because I have these two beautiful kids. So that's reassuring to me in itself. But I'm not, I'm not really okay. I'm still working on it, and I still go to therapy weekly, sometimes more than once a week. So I'm not there yet. Yeah. But you're here now, and that's the key. <laughs> it's not about being there, it's about being here. Yeah. And that's really, in, in this particular moment as we sit here, we are together, we're here, and nothing is horrible. That doesn't mean later on in the afternoon I won't feel any you know, impending darkness, or I did as I did yesterday, but you know, life is like a hike. It really is. I don't know what this analogy is leading to. <laughs> but, no, 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 but it is, no, but like, 
<laughs> life is like a hike. Can you imagine no, no. what it's like being his daughter? I get so many analogies. There's a lot of talking to. No, but, isn't this, but, but tell me if you like this one. Okay. Life is like a hike. You know, people go uh -huh. on a, and it, it, it's like beautiful. Mm -hmm. There's so many things to see. But sometimes it's really tough. And you, 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 choose, you could stop. But you want to climb, you know, and now you're on a you're on a ledge, and you, you know you feel like I just can't, I give up. But you want to get to that waterfall, you want to get to that thing. But sometimes, and sometimes, and this is the bigger problem, I think that you know an experienced hiker makes their way and knows the path, and we're going to go this, and knows how hard it is. Most people aren't experienced hikers. N nobody's experienced life before. We're all going through it together in real time. So you may have taken a hard path. You know, you don't know what that path leads. If you just go to some place, you may have taken the steepest, most dangerous, scariest, hottest, wettest path there is, and that's what mental health is. And then that doesn't mean you give up and you die. You wave through. How do you do that? How do you, you, you know, you preserve your water, you preserve, you cover yourself against the heat, you distract yourself, you look at your compass, you get whatever those coping skills to get to the end of your hike, but life is a beautiful hike, but it's really hard.